This presentation will do a shallow dive into some medication-induced problems that may present to the A&E. Pharmacists are certainly not diagnosticians. However, in my opinion, there are three areas a clinical pharmacist should have some diagnostic skills. One, in an emergency in the real world. Two, for minor ailments that present to the community pharmacy setting like cold sores, dyspepsia, or hemorrhoids, and three, for medication-induced disease states. Often, drugs can be the precipitating cause of complaints for a patient when they present to the A&E. It is the clinical pharmacist's responsibility to work with the physician to help them identify if drugs are causing the patient's problems and which ones are most likely the offending agents. Drugs can cause numerous problems, so we won't be able to cover them all in this presentation. So we will focus on the four bolded medication-induced disease states shown here that a clinical pharmacist can be vital in identifying and treating. Medications as reasons for visits to the A&D are quite common, with being shown as the cause in up to 12% of all A&E visits in the USA although likely lower in Hong Kong due to less total prescriptions per person the number is still significant and is expected to continue to increase many of the emergency department visits due to drugs are elderly patients and in pediatrics it is most commonly antibiotics as the cause other medications most often causing emergency department visits include anticoagulants opioids and SEDs among many others. Medication-induced fever will be the first topic we cover. There are many mechanisms in which the drugs can cause fever in the body, including a hypersensitivity or allergic reaction, altered thermoregulatory mechanisms, reaction to administration of the drug, or others. In mild allergic reactions, Fever will be the only symptom in a small portion of patients. So even though the patient doesn't have other normal allergic reaction symptoms, they could very well be allergic to the medication and only present with fever. Certain patient populations are at higher risk of developing a fever due to these medications, including the elderly, patients with HIV or cystic fibrosis, or patients with many comorbid disease states. Onset of symptoms and initiation of a new drug are things physicians look for but are often quite unhelpful based on previous literature. The median time to onset is about 8 days but varies from less than 24 hours to many months and can be fluctuating which makes it hard to pinpoint the date of onset. There can be significant and variable lag from when the medication is initiated until the patient develops fever. Upon discontinuation of the medication, fever may take up to four days to reside, pending clearance rates and possible metabolites. Some common causes of drug fever due to hypersensitivity include several of the anticonvulsants listed here and the onset of fever is usually around five to six days after initiation of these anti-epileptics. Antimicrobials are another obvious cause. With new data on long-term minocycline therapy, as previously it was only used for short durations, but now people commonly use it for long-term and acne treatment, and we are seeing that with long-term use, it can cause drug fever. Allopurinol is an uncommon but important cause of drug fever. There is a genetic component with allopurinol and is more seen at high doses or in patients with renal impairment causing accumulation. In populations of Han Chinese ancestry and Portuguese, HLA-B5801 is strongly associated with allopurinol-induced severe cutaneous drug reactions including dress.
allopurinol-induced fever is often accompanied by hepatotoxicity, deterioration of renal function, severe rash, and eosinophilia. Heparin can cause this drug fever, however, there are no reports of low molecular weight heparins doing so. A few drugs to note causing fever do so by other mechanisms, including levothyroxine and anticholinergics such as atropine, tricyclic antidepressants, promethazine, or antihistamines by changing the body's ability to auto-regulate its temperature. Some IV antimicrobials and chemotherapy agents cause it upon their administration. Then there are some that cause fever as an extension of their therapeutic effect, such as chemotherapy or antimicrobials killing cells that then release inflammatory mediators resulting in fever. Other disease states induced by medications that result in fever as one of the clinical manifestations include malignant hyperthermia, which may be caused by succinylcholine most often administered in the A&E, as well as neuroleptic malignant syndrome or serotonin syndrome. Drug-induced fever is a diagnosis of exclusion, which means that all other likely causes have to be ruled out before declaring it a case of drug-induced fever. This makes the disease far more expensive and labor-intensive. Also, the patient may go to the ward without a clinical pharmacist, so it can be important to assess the patient for drug causes of fever or other disease states in the A&E. Treatment is mainly focused on discontinuing one agent at a time to see if it is the cause. As these patients don't always need to be admitted, this will often be done on an outpatient basis with the A&E selecting the first, most likely cause to discontinue, then following up with their primary care physician in three to four days to see if it was effective in eliminating the fever or another medication needs to be removed in addition to what was selected by the A&E department. Patients can also come in with a bleed of unknown cause and a CBC may show a low platelet count with all other labs within normal range. Medications can be easily the cause of thrombocytopenia and should be assessed by the pharmacist. There are over 50 medications that have been shown to cause thrombocytopenia. However, most are very rare and you should focus on the more common ones listed here. Some drug-induced thrombocytopenias are not immune-related but rather done by bone marrow suppression. Heparin-induced thrombocytopenia is unique and can have different mechanisms and it doesn't fall under these categories. However, with heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, or HIT, platelet counts tend to not drop as low as with other types of medication-induced thrombocytopenia. Medication-induced thrombocytopenia is more common in adults, and you will see a decrease in platelet count in two weeks or less after initiation of the medication. The platelet count tends to drop lower than in HIT, with platelet counts dropping below 20,000 if not caught early enough. Of course, there are also many other causes of thrombocytopenia that have to be ruled out as well. Generally, in practice, we don't obtain antibody testing or rechallenge the patient on the medication as it is too risky. The pharmacist's role in a patient who presents with possible medication-induced thrombocytopenia includes identification of the causative agent, providing alternatives for the discontinued medication, bleeding management options, and then to inform the patient of a positive prognosis and timeline, as well as general housekeeping issues such as adding the medication to the allergy list 
and advising the patient about how they should never take the medication again and to avoid complementary alternative medicine treatments listed on the internet. In developed countries, obstruction of the common bile duct by stones in about 38% and alcohol abuse in 36% are the most common causes of acute pancreatitis. Medications are a cause of pancreatitis in about only one in every 100 cases. However, in HIV patients, it can be the cause in up to 40% of patients. As it is not hugely common, it is not important to memorize this table of potentially causative agents listed as a class 1 or 2 pancreatitis inducer and is commercially available in Hong Kong. It is more important just to have the information readily available for reference. It is very difficult to differentiate medications as the cause of pancreatitis from other more common causes. Rhabdomyolysis is most commonly caused by physical injury, but medications can also be a very common cause. The major concern with rhabdomyolysis is that it can lead to acute renal failure in up to almost half of patients. Risk factors for rhabdomyolysis include female sex, renal or hepatic dysfunction leading to accumulation of an offending drug, increased age, which also parallels renal dysfunction, high dosages of medications, and diabetes. Rhabdomyolysis is very common when using illicit substances, and about 11% of rhabdomyolysis cases are from prescription medications, most commonly the statins, antipsychotics, SSRIs, among several others. The treatment of rhabdo mainly circles around proper hydration and perfusion to the kidney to try to prevent acute kidney injury or failure. Normal saline is most commonly started and occasionally bicarbonate will be also infused to increase alkaline diuresis, but this is not common practice in Hong Kong. Mannitol was previously used but is no longer recommended as there was no evidence of it improving any outcomes in patients. Furosemide may also be used if the patient becomes hypervolemic from the normal saline infusion. In summary, a pharmacist should assist the physicians in diagnosing medication-induced disease states in the A&E setting. Antibiotics are a common cause of many medication-induced disease states, including thrombocytopenia, pancreatitis, and lupus. Fluids are the key to preventing common problems associated with rhabdo from medications or from other causes. These are the references. Thank you for watching.